Okay, our next uh, speaker is Professor uh, Max Saunders. Uh, Max is Interdisciplinary Professor of Modern Literature and Culture at the University of Birmingham. From 2012 to 18, he was Director of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute at uh, King's College in London, where he co-directs the Network for Life Writing Research. He studied at the Universities of Cambridge and Harvard and was a Fellow of Selwyn College, Cambridge. He's the author of Ford Maddox Ford, A Dual Life, Self-Impression, Life Writing, Autobiographiction, and the Forms of Modern Literature, Imagined Futures, Writing, Science, and Modernity in the Today and Tomorrow book series, 1923 to 31, and Ford Maddox Ford, Critical Lives. He's edited five volumes of Ford's writing, included an annotated critical edition of Some Do Not and has published essays on life writing, on Impressionism, and on a number of modern writers. He's co-editor with Sarah McDougall of Alfred Cohen, an American artist in Europe between figuration and abstraction, and Ego Media, life writing and online uh, affordances. So over to you, Max. Thank you very much, Roger, and, and many thanks to Meta for um, the invitation to be here. And, to her and her organizers for what, what's been a really wonderful conference. Absolutely um, endorse what Anki was just saying about it. Um, it's also been mildly terrifying for me speaking so late though, because day, you know, paper after paper has introduced ideas which I was going to talk about and, and you have a sense of your paper disappearing you know, through the day. Um, but, but I hope that won't matter too much because what I'm talking about is really material from nearly 100 years ago now, which is beginning to introduce some of the ideas that we've been hearing about so interestingly from people working on them today. So I'm just trying to work out how to do the slide. Ah, right. Usually, in ordinary life, we are not a single stream, but a welter of many semi-independent streams, said C.K. Ogden. He was certainly a man of many streams. He was as preoccupied with language and philosophy as he was with psychology. And he felt that the language we use to describe consciousness is particularly misleading, masking its dynamic nature and creating the illusion that our perception of the world uh, is more direct than, um, the, 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 than it is in reality. He was wary of the language of consciousness as being like a stream that we've been hearing so interestingly about, urging us to think in, um, in rather different sort of hydrological terms from the ones Nate was suggesting yesterday, he, he argues we should think more in terms of waves and eddies in the stream rather than the stream itself. And he continues, we may be adding up figures, watching a neighbour and thinking of what we shall do later in the evening simultaneously. Several separately disturbed systems are tending independently to their end states. And that last sentence recapitulates the equilibrium theory of consciousness that he's been discussing. Um, just before that, according to that theory, we're not passive spectators of our perceptions, but we respond to them, trying to readjust either the things that we perceive or to readjust ourselves, but either way, to put us right again, as he puts it. When there is only one such process going on, we say we are absorbed by what we're doing. When there are too many such separate disturbances or when the settlement of one interferes with that of the others, we complain of distraction. In deep absorption, as is evident from the story of the Mysore mathematician who tied a cobra round his neck in the mistake for a cravat, a change in the general situation, which would ordinarily cause deep disturbance, passes apparently unnoticed. What happens in such cases is difficult to decide. It's often alleged that such changes are always noticed unconsciously. The possibility of sometimes recovering them from memory by hypnosis or other special means, as in psychoanalysis, is the evidence for this view, 
It's not very strong evidence, however, for we more often never remember them and they have no observable effect upon us, whatever. The, the paradoxes in Ogden's language are telling here, I think, especially in those seeming oxymorons, apparently unnoticed, noticed unconsciously, unnoticed by whom or by what. I start with C.K. Ogden, who you can see here, um, because I think much of the interesting thinking in psychology in the early 20th century will, um, I mean, was happening around him, as, as, as I hope you will become conscious um, through the course of my talk. Ogden was um, alarmingly active. He edited four huge book series for Keegan Paul, and one which I'm sure the, the, um, the philosophers here will know about was the International Library of Psychology, Philosophy and Scientific Method, which began in 1922 with Wittgenstein's Tractatus, which Ogden characteristically helped him to trans or helped to translate, helped Frank Ramsey to translate. And it included landmark textbooks by major thinkers, including Jung, uh, Adler, Carnap, Piaget and Malinowski. Here are just 15 out of more than 160 volumes. And, and the series as a whole played a really massive part in the introduction of continental and American philosophical and psychological concepts to Anglophone audiences around the world, really. Um, but this was only one of Ogden's many activities. From 1922, he also edited the journal that we'd probably call Psyche, but he doubtless thought of as CK, um, like his own initials, and this covered a comparably broad disciplinary range and included many articles discussing consciousness. There was also a spin-off series of short books called Psyche Miniatures, which uh, also ran to over 100 volumes. Well, one of um, Ogden's closest friends and collaborators was the literary critic I.A. Richards. Um, and that's how Ogden's is sort of mostly known in literary studies, I think, through his connection with Richards. Together, they wrote a book called The Meaning of Meaning um, in 1923. And Richards, too, was struck by the conundrum of unconscious noticing. Perhaps it was something they discussed, as they discussed so much. And in an intriguing essay of 1927, which seems to me actually a, a foundational text of what's only now becoming known as attention studies, um, R Richards argues that there are too many appeals to our, our attention for us to be conscious of them all, and compares the situation to a telephone network in which sometimes calls can't be forwarded because the line is too busy. In these cases, says Richards, we ordinarily do not notice that any appeal has been made. We've been too much occupied to attend, but we may discover afterwards that we really did see or hear what it was that passed by unnoticed. Those curious cases in which people dream of the whereabouts of lost objects illustrate clearly this curious fact of seeing without <coughs> conscious awareness. And that last clause really, um, sort of makes clear what all this has to do with consciousness, that curious fact of seeing without consciousness awareness. We, we tend to call such moments absent-mindedness, but isn't that perhaps another example of where uh, our, our language leads us astray? Can the mind be absent if we've seen something and remember it, wherever, however we remember it? For that to be true, perception and memory would have to be thought of as separate from mind, which can't be right. Um, so how else might we think of them? These um, vignettes in both Ogden and Richards, I suppose, are examples of what Freud called the psychopathology of everyday life. And they're a far cry from the, the catastrophic pathologies which have afflicted the subjects of, of um, the Oxford studies in the minimally conscious state that we were hearing about yesterday. Uh, at least, I, I mean, I take it Ogden's humorous tone about the, the mathematician doesn't make it sound like the cobra bit him and, you know, they kind of <laughs> went into a, a coma or, or anything like that as a result. I've not been able to trace that story, but I think the mathematician from Mysore, who Ogden is likely to have known, is the brilliant Srinivasa Ramanujan, who was in Cambridge at uh, um, exactly that time. 
But, but from another point of view, th these episodes are um, a kind of example of minimally conscious states. And they raise the question, what is the least conscious you can be of something and still be conscious of it, still be said to have noticed it somehow or somewhere? And, and I think this raises interesting questions, which some of the papers have sort of touched on, about whether there's a scale of consciousness. Uh, is it something you can have less of? Clearly you can. Is it something you can have more of? I mean, some of the psychedelic work yesterday um, sort of brought that out really interestingly. Um, or is there a, a quantum of total consciousness which just gets divided up between the different calls on our attention until all the lines are busy? Uh, Ogden's welter of many semi-independent streams. But actually that view is edging towards a different model, and again one which we've heard a bit about today, in which the independent streams are not different streams of stimuli that a unitary mind is responding to, but independent consciousnesses of different stimuli. In other words, how many different consciousnesses might there be in one mind? A another writer in Ogden's circle called Claude Clermont published an article in Psyche in April 1929 called The Memory of Memories. He too starts from the argument that the metaphors used to describe consciousness and memory are misleading. Cons consciousness, he says, is thought of as something fixed in space, as if memories are pulled up from the unconscious and put in front of it. Um, and using similar arguments to Ogden and Richards about multiple calls on our attention, he says he prefers the analogy of a searchlight, which is constantly moving, sort of picking out first one corner of the sky or the horizon and then something else and something else. And it can light up each object in its beam with great clarity, uh, but it can't capture the whole scene in one take. Um, and he says what this beam of consciousness sees is then what is stored in the memory. And he uses the simile of a cinema camera next to the searchlight capturing whatever is illuminated. And then I think comes the clever turn in the argument where he says, if the mind works like that when our consciousness attends to perceptions, mustn't it also work like that when it attends to memories? Um, when we're conscious of memories, we would then be recording memories of memories, hence his, his title. And this tallies with what, what I understand current neuroscience says about memories not being retrieved like um, recordings or, or information on a computer device, but rather something that's recreated every time it's summoned back. Um, you know, that, that we have to have to remember the memory again, and, and that that sort of reenactment of, of remembering then accounts for amongst other things, the unreliability of memory. So I want to suggest, I mean, this recursiveness of memory of memories echoes the recursiveness of some of the classic arguments in the philosophy of perception. The, the indirect realism of empiricists like Locke postulated that we don't perceive objects directly, but we perceive their mental representations. But that was then seen as implying some kind of perceiver inside the perceiving mind. So perception isn't just perception, it's the perception of perception, like the memory of memories. And, and it offers then the prospect of an infinite regress of perceivers within perceivers. One direction these arguments might lead towards is to apply them to introspection. We've considered consciousness and memories, uh, so, sorry, we've considered consciousness of memories and consciousness of perceptions, but what about consciousness of consciousness? Uh, is such a meta level even possible? I mean, I think a lot of what we've heard um, the, this morning shows that, that it clearly is. I mean, where it, we can be conscious of, of objects or of sensations, but we can also be conscious of our own being conscious of those things. Um, It, do, it does seem possible to train the searchlight beam of consciousness on consciousness itself. And that after all is what um, the novels of the early 20th century, the, the period in which these psychologists were writing to, were perfecting. Um, writers like Henry James, Marcel Proust, proponents of the stream of consciousness like James Joyce or Virginia Woolf, and indeed HD, who Anki has just 
um, talked so interestingly about. Um, th these were all very much in the business of turning consciousness upon consciousness itself, making us more conscious of consciousness. That's a truism in literary history, but it's worth pointing out that they were not just trying to represent consciousness accurately, but also to heighten it, uh, trying to make us more conscious or maximal consciousness. I've concentrated on, on the trope of distraction, the paradox of unnoticed noticing, by way of posing some questions to this multidisciplinary group. And one of them is whether it's helpful to consider um, situations like that trope of absorption in relation to states like, like the minimally conscious state. Does it change either how we think about MCS or how we think about unimpaired consciousness in moments like absorption? But the arguments so far imply another set of issues and questions, which the second half of this paper is going to attempt to cover. And these take up that idea of increasing consciousness, of more consciousness. If consciousness is a scale with MCS at one end, then what's at the other end? Uh, what does maximal consciousness look like? That, that may sound like a, one of those annoying academic questions, but my reason for asking it is that a version of it was circulating um, amongst these writers of the 1920s and being construed in extremely interesting ways by them. Uh, they felt that mind was changing. In the essay I quoted from earlier, I.A. Richards put it like this, all through contemporary Western civilization, a change is occurring, he says, slowly in Europe, more rapidly in America, which may be described as the substitution of suggestion for tradition. The living art of America, its vaudeville, its skyscrapers, and its poetry reveals, we should expect, a still bigger break with tradition. And suggestion, a fact which many Americans seem to deplore, is much stronger. Witness the power of advertisement and publicity in America. An astonishing plasticity or adaptability and an equal suggestibility are the two impressions of American mentality which a visitor receives. It's possible that this very susceptibility to suggestion, explained in part by the mingling of traditions which is here going on, is the greatest asset of the American and the one which holds out most hope for the future of mankind. So it's a very odd antithesis that, isn't it? Tra tradition and not, not the things that tradition is normally opposed to, but tradition and suggestion. Richards goes on to say, man has been too little plastic, too little able to meet new situations with a new and appropriate response, too bound down by his habits. And I think it's fascinating to see that concept of plasticity, which has become so important in discussion of the creation of new neural pathways, appearing in this context nearly a, a century before. So mentality, in the US at least, the riches has changed, and it's changed because of what he calls new situations or later new conditions, uh, new technologies, including architecture, new culture, new sociology. In 1901, H.G. Wells had published a book called Anticipations of the Reactions of Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Thought rather an unwieldy title, and the book became known as Anticipations for short. Um, but the argument in the rest of its title, that, that mechanical and scientific progress have changed life and mind, is very much what Richards is suggesting too. But he takes it a stage further, trying to um, generalize about what the change is. He says, I've not really departed in all this one jot from my title, for the use of suggestion in this wide sense in place of tradition is virtually a making conscious of what was formerly unconscious. And his title, um, what arrested my attention in the first place really is the rather wonderful one, are we becoming more conscious? Um, it's a very odd question to be asking, I think, isn't it? Uh, a surprising question, but very typical of the kind of radical and, and field-changing questions that this circle of writers and thinkers around Ogden were constantly posing. 
the, the philosophical discourse of consciousness um, is, I think one could say, characteristically concerned with what consciousness is, the, the, the problem, the hard problem of consciousness, uh, rather than being so concerned with its limits, um, though, you know, we've heard um, s several papers that are the exception to, to, to that more general rule. Um, if consciousness can be reduced to minimally conscious states or, or states of absorption, can it also be increased uh, in total? Um, I mean, we, 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 you know, neuroscientists or, or, or philosophers um, will talk about the intensity of particular perceptions, but, but it's usually the intensity of particular perceptions rather than the intensity of consciousness as a whole. Um, what you know, so so the question that arises from this is: Can an individual become more conscious? What might that mean? Uh, is it something that happens to individuals, or can humanity become more conscious from one historical period to another, as Richards is suggesting has been happening in the U.S.? And I think one way of exploring this idea is to ask what Richards didn't mean. He didn't mean psychoanalysis, for example, and the bringing into consciousness of desires relegated to the Freudian unconscious. His remarks on tradition and habit, I think made that clear. He's thinking more of what goes without saying rather than what it's been forbidden to say. Nor is he thinking of eugenics. There, there were plenty of eugenicists in the period who thought that the mind could be improved in some way and that reproduction should be controlled uh, in order to make that happen faster. But, but that wasn't the line of any of the writers that, that I'm discussing today. It's more of a sense of social change producing new mental effects. And Richard sees that as having begun already. He's an Englishman in New York and is having the experience many visitors there reported as they encountered the first realizations of the second industrial age of mass production and new media. He felt like he was seeing the future. And that's why he ends several paragraphs with a look towards the future. Uh, he says things like this transfiguration of the unconscious into consciousness is to the English visitor, the dominant American characteristic, the feature which most links America with the future. Mm. But there was a more specific reason for Richards to move from thinking about the new in America to thinking about the future. And this too points back to Ogden. One of Ogden's other large book series, and in many, many ways the most interesting one, and certainly the most exuberant, was Today and Tomorrow. It's here that some of the more provocative new thinking about consciousness in the interwar period is to be found. The series started 100 years ago um, this year, the year after the launch of the International Library, and it continued for eight years up to um, 1931, and accumulated 110 volumes. These combined the brevity and the incisiveness of the psyche miniatures with the range and cutting edge quality of the International Library. There have been many book series popularizing um, science and other academic disciplines, but nothing quite like this one because its main focus was thinking about the future. Um, each writer chose a topic, <clears throat> sketched its present situation, then speculated about its tomorrow. And it had an extraordinarily stellar cast of writers, um, bringing together scientists like J.B.S. Haldane, J.D. Bernal, Sir James Jeans, Russell Brain, H.S. Jennings, the biologist, with writers like Robert Graves, Vera Britton, uh, Hugh McDermott, Vernon Lee, and Winifred Holtby philosophers like Bertrand Russell, C.E.M. Joad, and Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, who would go on to become the second president of India. Some of these were well known at the time, but for most, <clears throat> this was their first book, which indicates Ogden's gift for, for sensing the zeitgeist of the future, if you like, and, and having a sense of who would become the figures with future impact. Given the focus in the series on the future, together with Ogden's commitment to psychology and scientific method, it was inevitable that science would play a central role in the series. It began with Haldane's Daedalus, or Science and the Future, paired with Russell's response, 
Icarus or the future of science. Haldane in his research was helping to lay the foundations of population genetics. Um, and it was developments in biology and genetics, but also in physics and astronomy and in psychology uh, in the furious debates in, uh, between psychoanalysis and behaviorism, which inspired many of the writers. They shared a sense that it was the, the, this new science across various disciplines in the 20th century, which would be the most transformative um, thing in, in modernity and would most determine the future. James Jeans wrote in, in his volume for the series that knowledge of radiation and uh, other than light and the possibility of splitting the atom were, were very recent products, just the previous quarter of a century. And he called his volume EOS, uh, or the wider aspects of cosmogony, um, choosing the classical figure EOS, the dawn, to express that sense of being at the beginning of an exciting new era. And that was very much the spirit of today and tomorrow. And though Richards didn't write for it, he, he wrote for all of Ogden, well, for several of Ogden's other series, um, and his books for, for those were written in much the same spirit. And it was very much the spirit of his response to New York in 1927. You could say that the future was the change he felt he was at the beginning of while he was there. So there are two reciprocal points really, which emerge from these 1920 thoughts about consciousness and which echo through the Today and Tomorrow books. One is that, that idea of the enlargement of consciousness, whether it was already happening, are we becoming more conscious in Richards's question and how such increase might go on happening in the future. John Rodka, for example, who, who wrote a book for the series called The Future of Futurism, writes that what is new to humanity is the belated consciousness of its increasing sensibility. The, and the fact, I think, that the psychoanalysts and the eugenicists were asking the same sort of question as the futurologists about can consciousness be made better, bigger, you know, more, uh, shows how much traction that idea had at the time. Um, and the other point is that consciousness of the future was very much part of what that new enlargement of consciousness was. Um, these writers want to develop future thinking as a technology for becoming more conscious, to draw the future out of present suggestions. Today and tomorrow develops the idea of the enlargement of consciousness in other ways too, and it's with these I want to move towards a conclusion. And, and they too fall into two arguments, really. The, the, the first one, um, is that modern thought will make for an increase of intelligence, of reflexivity or, and consciousness on an individual level. Ogden began his ABC of psychology with, quote, four and a half good reasons for studying psychology seriously. And number three of those is, quote, we can be improved. Uh, in um, the volume Socrates, or The Emancipation of Mankind, from 1927, H.F. Carlyle argues that our conception of human nature has been fundamentally altered by recent investigations. He's thinking of um, psychology, and particularly the work of Freud, the behaviorists, and Taylorism. Just as Socrates challenged the Athenian world by questioning everything that was taken for granted, he says, the new sciences of the mind and behavior will transform the human of the future. Human behavior is still governed mainly by impersonal forces, he says, by instinct, habit <coughs> and tradition, very similar to what Richards is saying, of course. But the growing realization of this fact, you know, as we become more conscious of it, uh, with all the possibilities of deliberate self-development, which it implies, will lead in the end to a real freedom based on a real understanding. Following William James and others, Carlyle gives a sketch of what future improvements in, in our psychologies might amount to. He considers that abnormal mental states and individuals showing exceptional powers, such as savants, um, reveal potentialities of the mind that could be unlocked in the future. He says, vastly greater powers than we at present use will be commonly developed 
And, and that case of the savants is relevant to our consideration of different states of consciousness, I think, since they're frequently people on the autistic spectrum demonstrating unusually high competencies in particular areas, such as music or, or maths, say, combined with impairments elsewhere, um, such as in vision or language or other learning. The, the implications for the rest of us are ambiguous. Do, do such cases suggest, as Carlyle hopes, that the savants' extraordinary talents are latent in everyone, um, if we but knew how to unleash them? And if so, could other mental fu functions, including consciousness itself, be similarly amplified? Or do they suggest rather as with that attention, that notion of attention overload and the scenario of, of absorption, that there's a cap on total mental activity and that you can only increase it in one area by correspondingly reducing it somewhere else? The, the writer Vernon Lee in her volume for the series called Proteus or the Future of Intelligence from 1925, detects a similar enhancement in intelligence in the modern age, which she sees as being enabled by science. Hers is effectively a, a post-relativistic notion of mind as newly able to respond to a constantly shape-shifting reality. And as I was suggesting earlier, this isn't the eugenicist's view of um, you know, euthanasia for the mentally inferior, but rather a celebration of a kind of intellectual enlightenment, which for Lee, as for Richards and others, was, was enabled by the transition from a superstitious or religious worldview to a scientific outlook, and, and they saw as already underway. The, the gigantic figure of George Bernard Shaw hovers over several of the volumes exploring this theme in Today and Tomorrow. Shaw had written what he called a metabiological Pentateuch, um, titled Back to Methuselah in 1921, prophesying 30,000 years ahead. <laughs> and um, C.E.M. Jode, in his hilarious Today and Tomorrow volume called Diogenes, or the Future of Leisure, um, summarizes the progress of, of the so-called ancients in Shaw's play, uh, like this. He says, having exhausted the emotions to be derived from sex at the age of two, they proceed to art, which occupies them till they are four. They then turn from images only of reality to reality itself, which for sure is, is a matter of mind. The fast tracts of their prodigious lives are indeed devoted entirely to that study of reality, which in its initial stages in logic, mathematics and science, we today call thought. You know, but it becomes something completely different in this extraordinary world of Shaw's. Uh, the body is the last toy to be given up. And when that final emancipation has been achieved, there will be no people, but only thought, so that life becomes a whirlpool of pure intelligence, which began as a whirlpool of pure force. Jode, as you can sense, was skeptical of Shaw's prophecy, but shared his hope that, that the mental life would acquire greater prominence in future. He was a philosopher after all. Um, the, the, the second argument, though, that, that emerges from these books also draws on Shaw's vision, but takes, takes it further and imagines a new form of intelligence, which is not individual, but collective. Uh, and this is, again, something we heard a bit about yesterday, but, but the version I want to talk about is elaborated in J.D. Bernal's mind-blowingly visionary book for Today and Tomorrow, one of the few without a classical title, The World, the Flesh and the Devil, from 1929. Bernal, like Shaw, is thinking about how to extend human life, but also how to extend human thought, human consciousness. He, he effectively invents the cyborg in order to do that, um, elaborating what philosophers have subsequently termed the brain in a vat hypothesis, Bernal proposes removing human brains from their bodies and substituting machine hosts. Um, so like Shaw, he imagines giving up the body, though he doesn't want to give up his brain. Um, he thought the machine hosts should be able to keep the mind alive for longer and that they would have additional advantages of being able to extend the sensorium. 
adding not only ultraviolet and infrared sensors to our current visual range, but even sensors we don't yet have, such as a sensitivity to X-rays. <laughs> and imagining that such devices could be wired directly to the brain, um, he also imagines wireless connectivity so that we could communicate with each other directly by radio, which of course would be a sort of technological realization of the paranormal notion of telepathy, the direct transfer of thoughts, which wouldn't even need to involve speech. Um, and it's extraordinary here, I think, how Banal has sort of managed to anticipate the, the Wi-Fi internet before the invention of the computer which is about 13 years ahead at this point. I mean, you could say it was near enough for him to have a sense of the direction of travel, but even so, it is a remarkable bit of future thinking, I think. Um, and it's, I mean, it's the implications for consciousness that I want to focus on here. What interests Bernal is that such a technology would not simply enhance communication, that's obvious, but it would enable a new form of consciousness, he thinks because it would aggregate individual brains into a collective mind, the, the hive mind that uh, Meadow was talking about yesterday. Um, and, and, you know, an idea which is more familiar to us from science fiction, really, than, than this kind of speculative non-fiction, uh, uh, which the writing in Today and Tomorrow mostly is. But Banal's book is, is actually the only example of this collective form of consciousness in Today and Tomorrow. But J.B.S. Haldane had imagined something comparable, um, which Banal probably would have known, in an essay from 1927, uh, that year 1927 again, uh, called The Last Judgment. Haldane imagines descendants of humans living on Venus, 40 million years in the future. So he's gone even far further ahead than Shaw uh, or Bernal. Um, and these Venusians have evolved into what they call a super organism. The evolution of the individual has been brought under complete social control. This is Holden sort of you know, writing from the point of view of the Venusians. Um, and besides enormously enhanced intellectual powers, we possess two new senses. The one enables us to apprehend radiation of wavelengths between 100 and 1200 meters, and thus places every individual at all moments of life, both asleep and awake, under the influence of the voice of the community. It's difficult to see how else we could have achieved uh, as complete a solidarity as has been possible. We can never close our consciousness to those wavelengths on which we are told of our nature, as components of a superorganism or deity, possibly the only one in space time and of its past, present, and future. Sometimes you see people on Twitter referring to Twitter as a hive mind, uh, but I think its blend of trivia and trolling and conspiracy, together with genu genuine news and ideas, is doubtless not the superorganism or transcendental collectivity that Haldane and Bernal were imagining. Nevertheless, perhaps its version of communal consciousness has something to tell us about our own. Wittgenstein says rather startlingly, I can know what someone else is thinking, not what I am thinking. It's correct to say, I know what you are thinking, and wrong to say, I know what I am thinking. And then he goes on to remark, a whole cloud of philosophy condensed into a drop of grammar. His approach to meaning by attending to normal language use as, as there is to some extent the opposite of Ogden's crusade against the misleading effects of what he called word magic. It's possible that the wrong soundingness of the sentence, I know what I am thinking, is less to do with any logical flaw, you know, why, why can't you know what you're thinking? Surely at some level you must do. Um, but it's more to do with the fact that it's hard to imagine a context in which we'd ever need to say it. <clears throat> but if Wittgenstein is right, does it follow that we know other people's consciousness is better than our own? We certainly know whether someone is in pain or joyful from their expressions and other physical signs. The fact of language can give us insight into the whole range of other conscious experiences. <clears throat> 
And this suggests that we can learn as much about consciousness from written and spoken utterance as from in introspection, which leads to a curiously behaviorist conclusion that the surest guides to consciousness are perhaps external signs and processes rather than our own experience of interiority. The, the transhumanism of these visions that I've been um, talking about testifies, I think, to how far ahead of the intellectual curve some of these 1920s writers were. In many ways, as I've been suggesting, technology is only beginning to catch up with them, not only in terms of the internet, but the Elon Musk style visions of implanting chips directly into the brain, which will be able to connect to the, to the internet. And I think the, the predicament of these writers poised at the threshold of the age of the computer, which they could perhaps sense on the horizon, even if they couldn't see it clearly yet. Um, but they do actually write about machines that think um, is comparable to our situation poised at the dawn of artificial intelligence. It's perhaps not surprising, given, given that Alan Turing, for example, arrived at Cambridge in the last year of today and tomorrow when its ideas were still being discussed. Uh, and there were plenty of overlaps between Ogden's world and, and his world. Um, it's in discussions of AI, of course, that the notion of superintelligence is now most often discussed. And machine learning algorithms like chat GPT have arguably gone a long way towards realizing the banalian notion of collective mentality, or at least a version of it, aggregating and mastering all the human expressions of thinking that have been digitized and put out there. Um, as the results increasingly look like human utterances and get better at passing the Turing test, we're going to find it harder to be confident they do not manifest sentience and consciousness as well as intelligence. The, the, the discourse of neuroscience, um, in some areas at least, still appears to invest its hopes as well as its funding in a, in a comparable consilience between neuroscience and informatics. I mean, I've, you know, I've heard a certain amount of skepticism about that here as well, which, which I'm very glad to hear. But, um, but there are still people, I think, who want to test the hypothesis, at least, that ultimately, um, you know, it might be possible to, 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 to write software modeled on neuroanatomical structure that might be able to replicate brain processes including ultimately creating a, an artificial form of consciousness. That possibility, if it's still considered a possibility, conjures a future prospect of another possibility, that if human consciousness is susceptible of mechanical reproduction like that, then such artificial consciousness might be susceptible of artificial enhancement and enlargement as well, that, that consciousness could perhaps be augmented in that way too. If your individual brain structure could be uploaded and produce the effects of consciousness, would, would that consciousness be yours? And could we make it more conscious in Richards's phrase? And what might doing that tell us about our consciousness? So the, the 1920s style thinking about consciousness that I've been discussing is, is markedly different from what in retrospect has come to seem perhaps the most significant philosophical approach to consciousness in the period of, of the early 20th century, the phenomenology of Edmund Husserl. But, but it seems to me that the, uh, what is tantamount to an avoidance of phenomenology and the writers I've been discussing somehow cleared a space for, for them for a different and more speculative approach to the nature of consciousness. Uh, and that I hope some of the questions they raised might still be of interest at a time when neuroscience has really transformed the field. Thank you very much.